I read in my Thrasher the other day that in fact, what my band, along with other bands in the city, was playing was emo core. I'm thinking emo, emo Phillips, comedian, Ian core. Well, I know, emotional hardcore. As if hardcore wasn't emotional to begin with. Hey, welcome back to Ground Zero Salem. This is my video live journal. My name is Pat. Denizens of the internet, welcome. So, um, this is a tough one for me. I've, I've actually started this a few times, not had the energy, which has been a common trait lately. You know, that third shift life has been kind of getting to me. I'll do my best. Um, as promised a few weeks ago, I was going to talk about this early 90s kind of screamo, for lack of a better term, stuff that uh, was a deep dive I went on last month. I'm still listening to a bunch of it, but I've kind of moved back on to you know, metal or whatever. But I, I went on this big uh, binge of this stuff because discography CDs of this particular genre, this particular scene are pretty easy to come by and pretty cheap. Everybody wants vinyl, you know. Um, I figured I'd take advantage of that. I like a lot of these bands. They have a lot to offer lyrically and musically. There's some, um, you know, compared to the scenes that they were coming out of, there's a little bit more depth of mind. Um, a lot of this I was familiar with at when it was going on in the 90s, but I just kind of like, it's like, ah, it's, you know, not for me right now. Parts of it are, are, are sort of um, really dissonant, not to use an overused adjective, but uh, kind of noisy and stuff like that. And, you know, at a certain point, it just kind of gave me a headache. Um, I'm talking specifically with one exception about a, a bunch of bands from the genre from the early 90s. Um, there's one from the later 90s that I happen to just pick up randomly that I'll talk about. But this whole scene kind of evolved from, if you know anything about it, kind of evolved from like this post-hardcore kind of deal into its own thing. Um, it got very abrasive and noisy towards the end of the 90s and into the 2000s and almost turned into like another wing of grind, you know, and kind of merged with metalcore and some other stuff happened. But, it, you know, a lot of it was... Um, kind of signified by all this kind of off-kilter, very explosive drumming, um, these vocals that were kind of high-pitched and shrieky, which wasn't the case with all the bands in the beginning. Um, I don't know. It, it was it was its own thing. Um, the early 90s bands have been grabbing me lately because there's a good amount of traditional hardcore punk kind of woven in and played a different way, which is, um, you know, my bread and butter is that kind of 80s hardcore punk kind of stuff, uh, which I, I enjoy quite a bit. But this was almost mixing that with like some cool discordant qualities that it was kind of like, you know, a new thing for me, even though I was familiar with a few. But it, I think that's a purpose of a deep dive or becoming obsessed with or going after like a bunch of uh, records that you haven't heard before. You know, what's old is new kind of thing. And what sparked this is um, this hardware zine anthology, Omnibus, if you want, 93 to 97, a couple of dudes from New Jersey, and they put out this fantastic well put together zine um i heard of it at the time i was never able to get my hands on a copy uh i think in the 2000s a bunch of them got scanned and uploaded and i read them at the time but uh this is an interesting kind of evolution of the zine because in the very beginning they were the two guys who did this were really into talking about these bands uh that were on gravity records and gern blanston records that were doing this kind of new strain of DIY hardcore punk that, you know, as I mentioned, was kind of noisy and weird and a little bit more personal lyrically, somewhat influenced by the late 80s, mid to late 80s DC stuff, a little bit more musicianship, you know, a little bit more artiness, a free association lyrically going on. So after reading a bunch of reviews on this, I said to myself, I'm going to pick up a bunch of cheap discography CDs, and that's what I did. I feel like I should mention in this pile, there's a few things I threw in here just to mention maybe a few proto bands or precursors to this. It's kind of an amorphous, slowly evolving, fluid kind of deal with these bands. Um, they're not... They're all kind of singular in their own way, all kind of marching to the beat of their own drummer. There's just a bunch of token similarities. They all have their own unique identity, and as such, there's no, there's no direct evolution. You know, that nobody's trying to push the bar or outdo each other in extremity like some other genres I might be into. So it all kind of flows. Um, 
it does get more extreme in the late 90s. I'm not really going to talk about those bands because I'm not super into them. Um, never really got into the Locust that much, and who knows, someday I might might have to scratch that itch. Orchid, I liked okay. I saw them in Boston a bunch, but um, mostly this, this stuff is up to about 95 with one exception. So without further ado, um, I can't think of these bands for whatever reason without thinking about Iconochrist, and it might just be because even though Iconochrist was a straightforward punk band in a lot of ways, they were on Ebullition, uh, at least towards the end of their career, and uh, they played, I feel like they played kind of in both scenes, like the sort of the crusty punk scene as well as the more, you know, post-hardcore, whatever you want to call it, bands that I'm talking about. Ebullition put out a lot of that 90s screamo stuff, and this band had a lot more going on musically than, say, like a a filth or Christ on Parade or any kinds of bands. This band was from Arkansas, but ended up moving to the East Bay. And um, they just had like a really good bass player. They had a lot more complex song arrangements than your average, you know, fast punk band. A lot of their stuff was, was fast, but they utilized melody really well. Their vocalist had like harsh, deeper vocals, but he kind of sang. There's a lot of like, I feel like spiritual similarities to maybe Neurosis or Christ on Parade, but there's a lot more complexity than those bands. And they show a lot more like going on with what they're thinking about all their political topics. There's a lot more introspection. And I think that's a key thing with all these bands, introspection and a wider palette for displaying different types of emotion than just anger. Um, a big one is Moss Icon. Actually, I just got this baby in the mail like last week. Um, I can't comment it on comment on it too much. I spun it at work and I was like, oh yeah, this is a really important band for the scene, isn't it? A uh, little bit of research. This guy Tony Joy also played in Born Against, who I'll talk about in a sec, and Universal or Armageddon, who I'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> um, but this band was great. I mean, they have some stuff that's bordering on like mellow college rock like indie-ish stuff but there's some straightforward angry punk with some some weird songwriting choices some kind of interesting twists and turns as i like to say hoarse kind of shouted vocals very personal stuff very nice layout from this but the the more aggressive stuff is on the lp which has a weird name that i always forget liburnum liburnum don't know what that means i'll look it up later as well as a bunch of seven inches Almost all of these bands didn't put out full lengths, um, with a few exceptions. There's a lot of these compilations, though, that are all like three seven inches, two seven inches in a comp, you know, that sort of thing. I feel like the style of music was more intended for the vinyl format, but I really like throwing on a discography CD and ripping through the whole thing and hearing the ev evolution. Uh, mentioned Born Against real quick. This is not a new purchase. I've had this for quite some time. This is one of the first records I ever bought, which I talked about on my... 25 records that got me into hardcore punk video. Um, Born Against, I mean, started, they came out of a band called Life's Blood, who are one of my favorite New York hardcore bands. They're from Jersey and New York, you know, kind of floated in between. Uh, very provocative band politically and with scene politics too. They made quite a few enemies, it sounds like, um, kind of talking trash at the time. Uh, but very strong, you know, left-leaning politics, and a lot of their early material was kind of fast, dirty, sort of early 80s-inspired hardcore punk, much like Life's Blood, who they came from. But later on, they developed into this sort of noisy, weird kind of thing, and eventually they absorbed the guitarist from Moss Icon and, and Universal Order of Armageddon. That is hard to say. So much editing, man. Fuck. All right, and then uh, I, I just picked this up. I've been a big fan of Rorschach for years and years. Love me some Rorschach. Uh, sang their praises many a times on this channel. Very influential on metalcore, very inf influential on this kind of hardcore stuff. Discordant, kind of metallic. Um, you know, they listened to their share of death metal and you could tell, um, but it was not death metal musically at all um there's a lot of chugging and triple picking and stuff like that but the songs tend to just kind of fall apart with this really raspy screaming courtesy of charles maggio who runs this label gern Blans did, who put out a lot of stuff um i believe a couple of these that i ordered from he probably sent to me directly uh they were just a great influential act and i can't talk about this sort of noisy hardcore stuff without mentioning Rorschach. I feel like they kind of raised the bar for creating this sort of chaos 
um, within this kind of style of music. Uh, heroin, San Diego band. The San Diego scene was huge for this stuff. Uh, this band went on to do a lot of projects and be involved with a lot of other things, including Antioch Arrow, who were great, who I don't have anything to show by because they didn't have a cheap discography CD, but I'm going to at least get their first 12-inch at some point because it's brilliant. But this band was great. I, I love their fast parts. Their fast parts get melodic and almost almost go into like a just past youth crew kind of territory. Like I want to say the last couple things like Turning Point did, but... I might not be right about that. They do utilize those like kind of melodic octave passages a lot. There's a lot of noisy, bashing, screamy stuff going on. Um, very big fan of this stuff. This uh, little sticker, outside sticker, like from the gun there, is on the outside of the case, and that's how these were manufactured. And I think that's a very small token example of like how Gravity Records and a lot of those other record labels had their presentation at the time and their aesthetics. It was super DIY with like fucking twine and paper towels and manila envelopes silk screened and this is almost kind of a cute little nod like hey it's it is a cd but we still did our own little our own little personal touch there you go cd buyer um yeah gravity records this, again this is like i don't know three seven inches something like that i two seven inches and a and a 12 inch actually i have it written down i took notes i'm not using them but uh three yeah three seven inches um that isn't right though, because <laughs> I had a 12 inch of theirs. I want to say it's two, two seven inches in an EP. Not important, whatever. Uh, I, yeah, I did have a, tw a 12 inch of theirs back in the day and I purged it, you know, it just didn't grab me at the time. Now, um, the diversity in the music is really kind of, kind of knocking it out of the park for me. Then we got the Swing Kids. This is the band. It's post Unbroken, pre The Locust. This band was in existence for like a year, I want to say, or maybe two. They put out, again, two or three seven inches. This whole recording, it's nine songs, and it's over in a hot minute. I think it's like 15 to 20 minutes long. Um, as far as like all these bands, this might be one of the catchiest, even though their music is so like, you know, off kilter, off tempo, like a lot of these bands are there's just something about the riffs that sticks really well um it's very explosive and energetic there's a slight vibe of like some kind of americana or like film noir kind of thing about i don't can't explain why i know that they took a lot of some inspiration from the movie swing kids if you're ever familiar with that if you're at all familiar with that um the song warsaw is a joy division and before that warsaw the band cover um and a lot of those san diego guys they pulled a lot some inspiration from a fair amount from like death rock and joy division and stuff like that and kind of pulled it into a you know into the 90s in a very very different way aesthetically um next up we got angel hair pregnant with a senior class also on gravity this was a colorado band that moved to san diego this is the most like probably the most abrasive this is the band that kind of sounds more like the stuff that would come in the later 90s the really screechy vocals the really explosive all over the place kind of song structures songs are a little bit longer than say your heroin or swing kids kind of songs um as such i don't like this as much as those bands but there is a lot to take a lot to appreciate here there's good depth to the music and they do have the occasional fast part which is something kind of necessary for me apparently um universal order of armageddon this is a band i've known of for a while i thought i think i bought the site on scene when i lived in maine just because it looked like something interesting uh, i think this band's strength is when they play kind of these mid-tempo to fast kind of pummeling straightforward kind of songs they have like the slower discordant thing going on as well but if you pay attention a few updates back i used one of their songs as a as, as an intro to the channel um because it just is a pretty song i mean it's like kind of morose kind of punk um in some ways i don't want to say the wipers i can't think of what it reminds me of probably stuff like leatherface or something like that but uh tony joy also in this um, you can hear some riff similarities, especially with the slower stuff with a few Born Against songs, this kind of lurching kind of quality when he um, plays slower, heavier shit. And uh, Maryland Band, you know, 
I don't know if they shared more members with Moss Icon or not, but anyways, uh, Merrill, this is their discography. They were a Jersey band. This also came out on Gurn, Blanston. Um, this compiles two recording sessions with one song in the middle that's a WNYU Crucial Chaos radio show. Um, the LP sessions on this are kind of more typical of some of the other bands that I've been talking about previous to this. A little slower, heavier, you know, um, noisy. See how many times I can say noisy in this update. The second batch of songs may, are from one recording session, but made it onto a couple of seven inches, and they're they're way more like harsh and caustic and kind of fast. And I really like those. The song in the middle, the radio session song, is like it, it could be a bordering on grind or something kind of track. And uh, Charles Maggio from Rorschach guests on it. This is Uranus um, to this bearer of truth. They shortened their name, I think, by the time this came out. Um, they were called Union of Uranus before that. I'm trying to keep a straight face because I'm 12. This is uh, Yannick from Tragedy, and his hero is gone. This was a Canadian band. This band is very different sonically than a lot of these bands. I feel like the sort of discordant thing is the main, main strand that kind of ties them to this scene. And also, I mean, they played with these bands and everything. The presentation was pretty similar aesthetically vocals are uh you know they're not grating but they're a little bit more like you know they're a little bit more drawn out and um a little bit deeper than the average vocals for this sort of stuff but they were very epic like if you were to somehow meld this style of music i've been talking about with like something like doom metal <laughs> like that's a really bad way to describe it but they had a very like claustrophobic and impending doom sort of vibe to everything you could see how this guy would go on to influence the writing of his hero is gone in tragedy um but this you know also at the same time falls within this stuff it's a good like mediary sort of thing between those two scenes but this band was canadian they were around a little bit later i think they were around from 92 or 93 till about 97 um great great shit they did a double seven inches a double seven inch and a few other things then we have a another jersey band iconoclast on ebullition um this is uh this is a little bit more immediate and aggressive um same kind of similarities particularly in the vocal department with um what you would expect from this kind of scene but the guitar tone is a little bit more metallic and it's a little bit more like crushing I feel like, but a lot of people ride for this band really hard and it's understandable. They wrote, they wrote some pretty great stuff and Mohinder, this is fucking awesome. This is Bay area, um, screamo. And, uh, this might be my favorite of the pile. Um, I wasn't familiar with these guys at all. I just knew the name. They were a gravity band, but they played, uh, I think they played at the Gilman a lot. They were from Northern California. They were actually from the Silicon Valley. Imaginative with a rhythmic approach, really off tempo and all that stuff. Um, you know, use, utilizing more than typical kind of power chord riffs, blah, 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 like I said, but very, very fast and like aggressive. And I don't listen to live tracks often like that are bonuses on CDs. Unless they're really, really well recorded, like live album quality. But there's an entire track on here from Gilman that's uh, like 30 minutes long. It's just an entire set in one MP3, and I've listened to it all the way to all the way through at least a few times. It just really engaging, like weirdly catchy stuff like that. Um, just a real fucking face peeler. Then 1.6 band broke up. Also on Gern Blanston. Also from New Jersey, this band. I feel like they have certain things in common with this scene. Um, I'm sure the bands they played with and stuff like that. Guys wearing a Dag Nasty shirt, you know. Um, kind of this post-hardcore, beginning of emo, whatever you want to call it. But they also, like, seem to have just in mu as much in common with, like, the Minutemen. And, uh, like, No Means No. Like, lots of notes. Really busy musically. Lots of stuff going on, like, Dudes could play their asses off, off tempo, whatever, and screaming this and that, but really a lot more to hold on to as far as just like the density of the music and um, 
very impressive as far as like virtuosity goes. So that's a cool band. Um, yeah, they, I don't know, same thing, mid 90s. I'm not sure when. I think it was like 93 to 97 or 92 to 96, something like that. Then we got Portrait. This was an Atlanta band. And this is the only band that was around in the late 90s. Um, I think their full length or this discography came up just after one of the, when I was uh, previewing all this stuff on YouTube. I think it just popped up afterwards. And I was like, oh, Portrait, okay. Sounds like the name of a band that would be fit in with those. Um, came out in 90, they were around from like 98 to 2001. So they were a bit, they were later. They are a little bit more caustic, like I was talking about with like your page 99s and your, you know, orchids and stuff like that. Um, reminds me a lot of angel hair in some ways, but what's really cool about them and snags it for me is that it sounds like somebody who from my dying bride, like wandered into the studio. There's all this beautiful string work all over it that makes it like very melancholic and very different. I mean, I've heard that a little bit with some bands that kind of play in the crust scene, um, particularly like the melodic stadium crust kind of stuff bands, uh, not tragedy specifically, but some bands that I've seen with them what the fuck was the name? remains of the day and a few others. There's even, I've even heard people say cello crust, which is pretty funny, but I'd never, uh, I'd never heard of any stringed instruments on like this kind of explosive screamo kind of shit. And, uh, it's really fucking cool. Um, it, yeah, it's totally weird. You know, it, it does bring about the same kind of vibes to me as my dying bride, but put to, in this weird hardcore punks kind of context. It's, it's pretty cool. So, uh, this was a shit show. I don't know how to talk about this stuff and I'm sorry, <laughs> but whatever. I've been really excited about discovering this kind of shit. And I wanted to share it with everybody and hear everybody's uh, thoughts and, you know, maybe correct me on a few things or tell me what you think about this stuff. You know, if you're more of a metalhead, you know, have you checked it, uh, into all this stuff? Have you listened to it? I feel like a lot of a lot of that post black metal stuff and a lot of the kind of more noisy, primitively recorded kind of black metal might have some similarities sonically to what's that band Ferdy Durky. <laughs> uh, somebody said they sounded like a gravity records band to me. You know, there's, there's these weird threads that kind of tie things together. Um, I wish I'd, I could see Michael Laura do a video. I haven't seen him do one in like quite a while, but I, he mentioned that too, is that there's all these kind of sonic, sonic similarities between all this sort of noisy, hardcore stuff and black metal. So that's it. I'm going to mouth fart my way out of here finish my coffee of which I've had too much already. See you later.